The year is 326 B.C. Alexander the Great stands at the Indus River in what is now Pakistan. For a decade he and his Greek soldiers have been battling their way across the known world, defeating even the mighty Persians, rulers of Asia. Alexander's string of victories only feeds his hunger to conquer all, to know all. But his men balk. Tired of fighting, homesick, they refuse to go on. Alexander realizes he cannot continue to conquer Asia, but he is too curious to stop exploring. He has already built a fleet of 800 ships, appointed his close friend Nearchus captain, and sent them to investigate the coast of India by sea. And it is Nearchus who stumbles upon the sweet reed. The Greeks knew something of India actually the Indian subcontinent, the area that today includes the nations of India and Pakistan from the books of Herodotus, a writer who lived about a century earlier. He reported that when the Persian emperor Darius I invaded India around 510 BC, his men found a sweet reed that produced honey. The reed the Persians found was probably sugar cane. The tall thin stalks of cane resemble bamboo. They have a woody bark marked off with knobs. Strip off the bark, and the grayish inside of the plant is moist and sweet you can suck it between your teeth and drink in the juice. To this day you can find piles of sugar cane heaped in tropical markets offering buyers a refreshing treat that is somewhere between a candy bar and an energy drink. When Nearchus just sailed off to explore, he too found the reeds that produce honey, although there are no bees. The ever-curious Greeks were glad to learn of sugar cane, but it was just one more interesting fact about the natural world, the way a postcard from a summer vacation might list the sights a family has recently seen. No one could have imagined that those reeds would bring an end to the entire buzzing world of the age of honey, gods, and rituals. Cane sugar can be traced back to the island now called New Guinea, which is just north of Australia. Cane was probably first cultivated by humans on the island some 5,000 years or more before the Greeks. At first, cane was simply a wild plant that tasted good. Then people figured out how to grow it, just as they learned how to plant apple trees or berry bushes. From New Guinea, knowledge of the sweet plant slowly spread north to the Asian mainland. Polynesian seafarers also took canes with them as they sailed from island to island until they reached Hawaii around A.D. 1100. But it is in India, where it was used as an offering in religious and magical ceremonies that we have the first written record of sugar. Long before the first pyramids were built in Egypt, the ancient Sumerians traded with the people of Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro, who lived along the Indus River. Unfortunately, we are still not able to read the writings left behind from those ancient cities. So the first documents telling us about life in that region come from a much later period. These Hindu sacred teachings were probably first gathered together sometime between 1500 and 900 BC and were carefully memorized. Only hundreds of years later were they finally written down. The Hindu writings tell us of a religion in which fire was extremely important. People believed that the gods gave fire to human beings, yet fire was also a way for humans to reach the gods by placing offerings in a special fire. A priest could turn them into smoke and send them onto the gods. Five ingredients were selected for this special burning, milk, cheese, butter, honey, and sugar cane. One of these early Hindu writings, the Atharvaveda, speaks of an archer's bow made of sugar cane. It tells of growing a circle of sugar cane as a kind of sweet protection for a lover and it includes specific instructions on how to use sugar cane to worship and request help from Durga. The most important goddess, you lie down and face a three-cornered fire pot. Then, as you speak the sacred words, you place your offerings in the fire. Sugar cane was now an ingredient in ceremonies involving fire. Maybe after many, many offerings a priest noticed that if the juice of the cane was boiled in the right way, it crystallized into sweet dark brown clumps. Perhaps the transformation itself seemed magical, a heated liquid turning into something that looked like dark grains of sand. In the Atharvaveda, sugar cane is called ikshu, which means something that people want or desire because of its sweetness. But once people learned how to make sugar crystals, they began to use the name sharkara, which also meant gravel. Though Indians used sugar in rituals, they also enjoyed eating chunks of sugar cane. The word for a piece of sugar in the ancient Indian language of Sanskrit is khanda, which, as it passed through Persian to Arabic to Europe, became candy. Sugar had a third use in ancient India it was considered a medicine. 
Today we say, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. But from ancient times until quite recently, sugar itself was a medicine, a means of healing. The next step in the spread of sugar came through a university that was the crossroads of all the world's knowledge, the world's first true university. Today, few people have heard of Jenny Shapur, but in its time, it was an exceptional university. Jenny Shapur was built in what is now Iran sometime between the 400s and mid-500s AD. We can only guess the dates, but we do know more about the school. It was the meeting place of the world's great minds. In 529, Christians closed the school of Athens, the last link to the academies of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. The remaining Greek scholars moved to Jenny Shapur. Jews joined them, as did a group of Christians called Nestorians, who had their own ancient and scholarly traditions. Persians added their voices and one of their learned doctors set off for what is now India to gather and translate the wisdom of the Hindus. The school created the very first teaching hospital in the world, a place where the sick were treated and young doctors learned their craft, as well as a fine observatory to track the heavens. At Jenny Shapur the best scholars west of China all gathered to think and study together. By the 600s the doctors at the school were writing about a medicine from India named Sharkara or, as the Persians called it, Shaker Sugar. Indeed, scholars at Jenny Shapur vented new and better ways to refine cane into sugar. Since the school had links with many of the great civilizations of Asia, the Mediterranean and Europe, word of sugar and the experience of tasting its special sweetness began to spread. But that does not mean people were baking sweet cakes and topping them with sugary icing. Today we generally think of sweet things as completely different from salty ones. We eat fruit for breakfast, and if we eat meat as a main course, it is usually at lunch or dinner. But in those days, if people used fruit, honey, and sugar to sweeten foods, they often mix salty or even bitter tastes with sweet ones. We still sometimes do that today, for example, gingerbread mixes sugar with spices such as ginger, clove, and nutmeg. A salty ham may have a sweet glaze, a Thanksgiving plate will often have both turkey and cranberry sauce. Foods such as these, which are eaten on holidays, often preserve tastes and ways of cooking from earlier times. When knowledge of sugar was just beginning to spread from India, from Persia, from Greece, from the great school of Jenny Shapur, cooks working for the wealthiest people treated it as a spice, blending it with other tastes. They continued to do that for another thousand years. But the world of sugar was about to grow very rapidly spread by a storm unlike any the world had ever seen, Islam, the storm of God. When the prophet Muhammad began preaching in A.D., 610, he attracted only a few disciples. Yet by the time he died in 632, his faith had spread throughout Arabia. By 642, the armies of Muslim conquerors, along with the arguments of the Muslim faithful, took the religion all across Syria, Iraq, parts of Iran, and Egypt. From there, Islam spread through North Africa along the Mediterranean, across to the Iberian Peninsula, and over to France. Islam's march into Europe ended in 732, when the French defeated the Muslim armies at the Battle of Poitiers. But that was not all. Muslim rulers took Alexander's old lands in Afghanistan and then, from there, swept through to conquer northern India. The pagan tribes of Central Asia chose Islam. By conversion or conquest, Islam, the religion of Muhammad, won over nearly all the lands of the ancient world, Egypt, Persia, India, and the Christian Mediterranean. The vast Muslim world was wonderful for the growth of knowledge. The Greeks had developed a level of practical experience and technical understanding a thousand years more advanced than anyone else nearby. The Muslims began to translate some of these ancient Greek texts. From India, Muslims learned of the zero, which allowed them to invent what we still call Arabic numerals. And because the Quran, the sacred book of Islam, is written in Arabic, scholars throughout the Muslim world learned to read Arabic and to share their knowledge. The Muslims swept past Jenny Shapur and learned the secrets of sugar. As they conquered lands around the Mediterranean Sea, they spread word of how to grow, mill, and refine the sweet reed. Masters of sugar, the Muslims began to use it in lavish displays. Combining sugar with almonds as is still done in marzipan cooks who were serving wealthy Muslims built elaborate, edible sculptures. One Muslim ruler filled a feast table with seven large palaces made of sugar. Another displayed an entire tree made of sugar. 
Sugar was now a Muslim luxury, a sign of the wealth and generosity of Islamic emperors and kings. With the rise of Islam, Egypt became the world's great sugar laboratory. The kind of sugar easiest to produce from cane is dark a color comes from molasses, which also makes that form of sugar spicy and even bitter. What we call molasses is just a natural part of the first grinding of sugar cane into syrup. Sugar refiners drain out the dark molasses to use by itself and are left with relatively white sugar. The noble and wealthy who could afford sugar wanted it to be as pure, sweet, and white as possible. The Egyptians figured out how to meet that need. After the Egyptians crushed cut cane and captured the juice, they boiled and strained the liquid, let it settle, then strained it again. The cane juice was now poured into molds with holes in the bottom so that all the liquid could drain out, leaving only a powder. The powder was then mixed with milk and boiled again. After one round of these steps, the process was repeated all over again. As a result of all this effort and care, Egypt was known for the whitest and purest sugar. The world of sugar centered on the Muslim Mediterranean, but it also stretched as far as China to the east and even Europe to the north. Marco Polo visited the empire of Kublai Khan in the 1280s. He noted that while the Chinese had known how to grow cane and produce brown sugar for over a thousand years, it was certain Egyptians at the Khan's court who explained how to make the dazzling white sugar coveted by so many. While the Islamic world was spreading and absorbing new knowledge, enjoying the taste of sugar, Europe had gone the opposite way, isolation. Fortress Europe. Picture a feast in a medieval castle. You'll have to guess, because there were no cookbooks in Christian Europe until the 1100s, and why should there have been? Cooks had no reason to be able to read or write. Wealthy lords could afford meat. Poor people ate bread. When a lord had a feast, he served meat on bread instead of using plates. People ate on trenchers, which were just slabs of stale bread, ever since A.D. 400 when invaders rampaged through Rome and the Roman Empire began to crumble, Europe had become increasingly violent, ignorant, and divided. While Muslims studied the words of the ancient Greeks, most Europeans turned to counting on their hands and only a few knew how to read. Except for some merchants looking for business, no one ventured very far. The outside world was just that a long distance away. Still, from what we can tell, everyone, rich or poor, liked to flavor their food with spices a taste that may well date back to Roman times. Even though one book after another repeats the myth, the popularity of spices had nothing to do with disguising the taste of meat or fish that had gone bad. Any lord who could afford spices which were expensive could easily get fresh meat or fish which were readily available, and when a cook happened to be stuck with rancid food, the spices he had available could not hide the awful smell or taste. Whenever they could, people used the spices that were so popular. They became an expensive necessity, pepper, ginger, sugar, sometimes saffron. Only the very rich could afford the luxury such as ambergris which is coughed up by whales and offers a strange, perfumey taste of the sea. In the 1100s, the richest Europeans slowly began to add more flavor to their food because of a series of fairs and wars. A smart count in the Champagne region of France guaranteed the safety of any merchant coming to sell or trade at the markets in the Lord's lands. Soon word spread and the fairs flourished. Starting around 1150, the six Champagne fairs became the one place where Europeans could buy and sell products from the surrounding world a first step in connecting them to the riches and tastes beyond. Fortress Europe was slowly opening up. The Champagne fairs. The markets began in January in lagny sur marne near Paris. For two months, merchants from cold northern Europe came to trade with businessmen from warm Italy. One after another, five more French cities held fairs until the last one of the year ended in Troyes in December, and then the cycle started again. The fairs were very well organized. They featured covered galleries so that merchants could buy and sell even if rain came drumming down. Sellers were so large, they resembled underground cities. At the fairs, merchants could trust the weights and measures, and a strict order prevailed for how things were to be sold. For the first 12 days one could sell only woven cloth which is what the traders from northern Europe brought. Then the sergeants of the fair would walk through the streets crying, pack up, pack up, and all the cloth must be put away. Now the leather traders, who came from as far as Spain, and the fur merchants, whose goods might come from Russia, filled the tables with piles of hides and pelts. The traders who came up from Italy offered items they had bought from Muslims which were not available in Europe. 
fruits such as oranges, apricots, and figs, dyes such as cochineal, which produces a rich red, rare fabrics such as cotton and raw silk. Many of the fabrics that we know of today came to Europe via the Muslims, and their names still show their origins, damask from Damascus, muslin from Mosul, gauzes from Gaza. The Italian merchants sometimes sailed across the Mediterranean Sea to Syria, where they could buy black pepper that had been grown on the southwest coast of India. The tiny dried black peppercorns were the perfect item to trade, because the small ships of the time could carry enough to make a nice profit. From India the pepper was shipped across to Arabia, where camel caravans would carry it all the way to Syria. The Italians could purchase enough pepper in Syria to carry with them to the next Champagne Fair. Every count whose cook added the bite of costly black pepper to his food knew he was getting a taste of far distant lands. As late as 1300, Jean de Joival, a French writer who had actually lived in the Muslim world, still believed that these spices came from the outer edges of the Garden of Eden, located somewhere along the River Nile. There, people cast their nets outspread into the river at night, and when morning comes, they find in their nets such goods as ginger, rhubarb, wood of aloes, and cinnamon. Next to the mounds of fruits and spices at the fairs were piles of a medicine that the Italians also bought from the Muslims, sugar. Nice white sugar. When taken moderately cleans the blood, strengthens body and mind, especially chest, lungs, and throat, noted a physician in the 1500s. He did though point out that it makes the teeth blunt and makes them decay. Since sugar had a pass through many hands before it reached the fairs, it was expensive and hard to get. King Henry Roman III of England, for example, liked sugar. Yet there was little he could do to satisfy his craving. He wrote to one official in 1226 asking if he could possibly obtain three pounds of the precious substance at a cost of about 450 modern dollars. He later appealed to a mayor, hoping he might be able to get four more pounds of the rare grains. And finally, by 1243, he managed to buy 300 pounds. The fairs lasted until the 1300s when Venice came to dominate European trade with the Muslim world. The Venetians greatly expanded the sugar trade, so much so that a hundred years after Henry Roman III reign, the English were able to buy thousands of pounds of the sweet stuff each year. Perhaps their taste for it grew because Europeans had been exposed to sugar in a different way, through war. Out of war comes sweetness. According to the Gospels, Jesus lived and died in what is now Israel. Christianity was born there and in cities near the Mediterranean. But with the rise and spread of Islam, those holy lands were no longer ruled by Christians. In 1995 Pope Urban Roman II rallied the Christians of Western Europe to set out on a great mission to take back those sacred lands. We know these wars as the Crusades' bloody, gruesome conflicts, the scars of which are felt in the Middle East to this day. But the Crusades were more than battles, they were also an information exchange. As a result of their contact with Muslims, the Europeans began to break out of their sealed-off world. They learned mathematics and, according to some scholars, how to build windmills. Windmills were a great power source that allowed Europeans to drain swamps and make use of lands that had previously gone to waste. With more land, they could grow more food. This knowledge that Muslims had helped Europe to get on its feet. And wars against the Muslims brought Europeans to sugar. As they marched to the Holy Land, Christians noticed certain ripe plants which the common folk called honey cane and which were much like reeds. In our hunger we chewed them all day because of the taste of honey. The Christian crusades in the Holy Lands failed as the Europeans could not hold on to any sites taken from the Muslims for very long. But Christians did control fertile islands in the Mediterranean such as Sicily, Cyprus, and Rhodes. There they began to apply skills they had learned from the Muslims, how to plant sugar cane, and how to refine sugar. That was valuable knowledge, because while it is not hard to grow sugar cane, farmers who plan on making sugar itself face a special challenge. The problem with sugar cane. There are two problems with cane if you want to make vast amounts of sugar, one of time and the other of fire. Growers claim that the instant a knife sliced the stalks, the sweet mass inside started to harden and turn woody, Apparently, if they did not get the cane into the boiling vat within 48 hours, preferably 24 hours, their crop would be ruined. Whether or not that speed was absolutely necessary, owners insisted on it. They may also have been thinking of pure economics. Once you cut cane, it begins to dry out. 
Piles of cane are heavy, bulky, and hard to move, while sugar and tiny crystals can be packed into barrels and shipped by water. Cane loses money as long as it sits, and is on its way to making money once it has been made into sugar. For the growers, time truly was money. The only way to make a lot of sugar is to engineer a system in which an army of workers swarms through the fields, cuts the cane, and hauls the pile to be crushed into a syrup that flows into the boiling room. There, laboring around the clock, workers cook and clean the bubbling liquid so that the sweetest syrup turns into the sweetest sugar. This is not farming the way men and women had done it for thousands of years in the age of honey. It is much more like a factory where masses of people must do every step right on time together, or the whole system collapses. The Muslims worked out a new form of farming to handle sugar, which came to be called the sugar plantation. A plantation was not a new technology but rather, a new way of organizing planting, growing, cutting, and refining a crop. On a regular farm there may be cows, pigs, and chickens, fields of grain, orchards filled with fruit many different kinds of foods to eat or sell. By contrast, the plantation had only one purpose, to create a single product that could be grown, ground, boiled, dried, and sold to distant markets. Since one cannot live on sugar, the crop grown on plantations could not even feed the people who harvested it. Never before in human history had farms been run this way, as machines designed to satisfy just one craving of buyers who could be thousands of miles away. On a plantation, there were large groups of workers between 50 and several hundred. The mill was right next to the crop, so that growing and grinding took place in the same spot. And all the work was governed by extremely tight, rigid discipline. The Muslims began to put together the rules for this new kind of farming. Both they and the Christians experimented with using their slaves to run the plantations. At first many of the slaves working sugar plantations in the Mediterranean were Russians or anyone captured in war. But even all this careful organization did not solve the second problem with sugar. In order to keep those vats boiling, a great deal of wood to burn was needed. Later on, sugar planters figured out that they could use the crushed cane stalks as fuel. Not many places in the world offer rich lands that can grow cane or near water so that the sugar can be easily shipped to distant shores and are filled with trees ready to be cut down. The sugar plantation solved the management problem of cutting and refining a large crop, but it did not supply growers with the forests they would need to cut down in order to boil the sugar syrup. In the 1400s, Spain and Portugal were competing to explore down the coast of Africa and find a sea route to Asia. That way, they could have the prized Asian spices they wanted without having to pay high prices to Venetian and Muslim middlemen. Spanish and Portuguese sailors searching for that sea route conquered the Canary Islands and the Azores. Soon they began building Muslim-style sugar plantations on the islands, some of them staffed by slaves purchased from nearby Africa. One sailor came to know these islands particularly well because he traded in white gold sugar. And then, as he set off on his second voyage across the sea to what he thought was Asia, he carried sugar cane plants from Gomera, one of the Canary Islands, with him on his ship. His name was Christopher Columbus.